thing started when we read in the newspaper that there was this $17 million harbour foreshore plan devised uh, to coincide with the bicentennial year. We just wondered from the drawings what it would look like in you know, real life and how that would, could upset a whole neighbourhood or improve it. But something would definitely um, you know, drastically change within that time span of three years or whatever. So I just thought it would be interesting to document um, the people who lived here and some of the people who, you know, had well grown up here or artists who lived here now. It's like um, taking something for a little while and looking at it closely and then you put it aside. It's just to examine change. A place undergoing change will inspire many thoughts from reminiscences which are sometimes pleasant, sometimes sad, to conjecture about the future, perhaps with relief at the vision of a new prosperity or anger at the possibility of losing a valued part of our heritage. The first step was to hold a public meeting to gauge the level of support for such a project within the East End community. So we held a public meeting at TPI House in Scott Street in April 1984, where we invited residents to participate by supplying memorabilia and oral histories, and then perhaps learning to make their own prints. Rob Winston, a past president of the Newcastle Printmakers Workshop and acting town planner at this time, outlined the history of planning and development in the area and acknowledged the heritage value of the East End. Night classes, discussions, critiques and weekend workshops were all part of the process of exploring the potential of this visual arts project. The Awabakal Aboriginal Cooperative formed a silkscreen collective and made their first prints in a 12-week course at the Printmakers Workshop. They focused their attention on the Aboriginal legend of the giant black kangaroo who lived on Nobby's Island long before the white man constructed the breakwater joining Nobby's to the mainland. The strongest sense of excitement about this project came in talking to the residents and individuals who have had a long-term interest and concern with Newcastle's East End. And how long have you lived in this area? And has your family, like your mother, did they live here before you or were you new uh, to the no, area? No, um, I was new to the area 20 years ago. 20 years ago? Yes, when they have been. You obviously like living in the area. Oh, I just love it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me why you love it. Um, love everything about it, the people, the atmosphere and of course the pool and the beaches. There's also a housing commission development planned here. Um, how do you feel about um, well, what you lose from that redevelopment in terms of Yes, well space? we'll be losing a lot in as much as our view privacy, our nor'easter that we get. And we're awfully sad that with the Harbour Shore beautification that's going on down in front of us, that in the end we won't be able to see it from this point. It will be blocked out by the six-storey buildings going up 
directly in front. So we're going to be left without all views around, which is unfortunate and sad for mm. us. The whole area seems to be changing now. Yeah. Yeah. It has yeah. changed. Um, Newcastle East was always a little intact um, mm. residential island almost, mm. and it had been fairly self-sufficient, I think, over the years. And it has to do, I think, with the proximity of one neighbour to another and, mm. and things like that. But of course, the character of Newcastle East has changed because a lot of older residents aren't here any longer. Mm. And so new people have moved in and those new people plug into other sorts of support systems other than just, you know, the neighbourhood mm. support system. I think it has retained a lot of that um, identity that made it special. Mm. Uh, but, you know, maybe the actual neighbourliness and uh, mutual support thing has lessened to a degree. Well, Newcastle's one of those places where, it, with its convict uh, origins, I don't think that uh, a great deal of thought was given to the natural beauty of the place. It was really it, probably one of the most beautiful places naturally. You know, the fact that they were cutting knobbies down gives you an idea of how they thought about the environment. And when you see these photographs, these old paintings and things like that and drawings, mm. you just realise just how distinctive mm. the landscape yeah, was. And I've not done the research, but someone should be doing the research to bring all this together. Mm. This is not only the place where land Shortland landed, this is the, the place where coal was first discovered. It's the place where where there's the only British fortress, you know, enclosed fortress in, on the coast of uh, Australia, mm. uh, at Fort Scratchley. The breakwater, which is uh, the most important, significant development of the port of Newcastle, because it's, uh, it's, it's the first stage in developing the port of Newcastle. You know, th there mm. must be a lot of uh, other information that if a researcher uh, was working on it, they would find. Mm. Newcastle East, the site of the convict stockade and jail, isolated from the rest of the township by sand hills, was considered a no man's land. However, from the 1890s up to the 20s, the East End was developed as a glamorous residential resort, with villas, guest houses and cafes being constructed. When I was a little girl, I used to always have the band every Sunday on the top of the beach. Mm, and people would sit around and then they'd come with little money boxes. And... By the 30s, the streets housed working families in rows of terraces. And many of these dwellings still stand, saved from the developers by the Newcastle East Residence Group and the Trades Hall Council in the 70s. By the 50s, the word eyesore was being used constantly to describe the area. Newcastle East had for a long time been regarded as a rather sleazy, undesirable place to live. Its industrial functional role was never more evident than in those years when the powerhouse dominated the area and held up any interest in development of the East End. The demise of the guest houses, hotels and cafes during the 50s meant the loss of the East End as a resort area. And this decline continued through to the late 70s with the demolition of the residential flats, houses and shops around Pacific Park. The 
planned demolition of the Golden Sands Hotel and other shops, houses and residential flats around the present Pacific Park brought the dispute between residents and Newcastle City Council to a head. I would like to see a plan implemented. There's been so much uh, demand for the release of the East End land for going back over many, many years. And uh, I did feel that now that it's been released, there was a, leth le a real lethargy about uh, getting on with the job of determining a plan for the area. Do you think maybe you took them by surprise a little bit, uh, I, releasing the land? Yeah, I think so. Well, what kind of uh, things would you like to see there now? Well, I would like to see uh, our land 25 to 30 acres incorporated in, a, in an overall plan for the area and the city has a, a much larger area there to develop. Mr Fife is uh, endeavouring to get rid of the Zara Street power station and we don't expect wonders overnight. This is a plan be, that will be implemented between now and the turn of the century. But instead of talking, I think we do need some plans in the very near future from the early 50s up to the 1980s, there were so many successive plans for the East End to become a showplace for the city that one finds it difficult to follow. Varying approaches were taken by planners to considerations such as height, density, zoning and attitudes towards the residents. This resulted in markedly different development plans, all of which were considered to be most beneficial to Newcastle East. The Newcastle East Residents Group was formed to be the people's voice in the ensuing battles with council and developers. When you did your survey going around the East End, they were quite shocked by what was planned for the East End. Oh, quite shocked. And uh, mm. they had no previous knowledge that those plans were even in the pipeline. Mm. And they were plans for major redevelopment of this area. But more to the point, what was more threatening to the residents was that they involved the demolition of a, of a great deal of the housing stock that existed at that time. And uh, inspections had been made and uh, lots of people were upset about you know, that process occurring without any involvement mm. um, on the part of the residents in those decisions. Mm. And the reason we actually did the survey was not only to um, find out what people thought about those plans for redevelopment, but, but it was also a way of informing people about what was proposed mm. Mm. and um, at, at that stage it was decided that a new group needed to be formed up here in the Newcastle East area to address the issues that were being raised by that planning. Mm. Well, when That's this right. is all packed up and handed over to Council, how long is it going to take them to consider it or when do they consider well, we, it? We will submit our final report by the end of this month and the basic exercise from now on as far as we're concerned is to evaluate the basic alternatives on the basis of the feedback that we hope to get, you know, as much feedback as we can from this exhibition, and particularly from the residents group. And uh, our final report will evaluate all the alternatives and firm up on, you know, basic recommendations uh, on one. Newcastle East Residents Group commissioned Alan Butler, an architecture student, to devise a people's plan which could preserve the East End as a recreation area as well as preserve its historic character. When we first came up here, the powerhouse was there, and people that lived with it sort of well sort of be there all the time for the electricity of it. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to get a lot of dust and soot and things like that, but just sort of put up with it in those days. Mm -hmm. Regarded by many as the main obstacle to beautification of the Newcastle Harbour foreshore, the powerhouse, which was built in 1927, was finally demolished in 1978. The vacant land now forms part of the Bicentennial Housing Commission project. I'd like naturally like to think that we would have been able to just continue on the way we are with what we've got around us. But we have to accept progress. Now with progress there is change. It wasn't until the mid and the late 70s that we started to realise that we're really just destroying our parts. And we started to have more of a feeling for trying 
trying to, to uh, keep our, our heritage values. And some of these heritage values that we're looking at in terms of buildings are, are not things of national significance, they're things of local significance, but they're important to the local area. <laughs> Do you think the show will have much relevance to other communities? Well, um, in its imagery, it is very specific to the east end of Newcastle, but as a basic idea of um, um, following up a kind of, or exploring a transition period in a community, I think it could be quite relevant to other communities.